Thanks for putting this on. It's been really great. Oh, yeah, no, man. I'm sitting here with a cold high life, and it's so humid, it makes me feel like Chicago summer, you know? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All humid and hot. I'm just like, oh. Oh, my gosh. So I guess I'll start. Um, I'm Josiah Zayner. I did a PhD in biochemistry. That's probably my claim to fame. <laughs> I, I worked at NASA for a little bit, and I am, I guess, a biohacker. It's interesting because I used to always call myself a biohacker when, when reporters and journalists would be like, well, you know, what's your byline? And I'd be like, biohacker. And then they started writing all these stories where they would leave out that I have a PhD and all this other stuff and mention everybody else had PhDs to kind of like downplay the stuff I did. It's completely true. I noticed that John Oliver did that, which I thought was sort of below him to have... Oh, really? Didn't he? I don't know. I, I, I didn't pay much attention. I hate that stuff. <laughs> Oh. Well, I, I normally like what he does, but I was really surprised that I think he did strategically neglect to acknowledge that you were a credentialed scientist and not just a wacko because it wouldn't have served his story. I know, and it's crazy, you know, and I don't want to say that a PhD means much or anything like that, but, like, I published legit papers and legit journals. I won the best thesis award at the University of Chicago. Like, this wasn't no, like, fake PhD or anything like that, and, you know, sometimes it kind of hurts me a little. <laughs> <laughs> it does a little bit, yeah. So I started telling people now, like, they're like, what's your byline? I'm like, PhD. <laughs> uh, anyway, give, give yourself a little intro. <laughs> I am probably best known as a science journalist here. I make a, a show called Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia that is on a channel called Viceland. I also... Um, have done other incarnations of that same show for other channels, done things for National Geographic. I'm a correspondent on one of Vice's shows on HBO, and uh, I also do some chemistry work as well. Yeah, so it's really interesting. You know, I, I've seen some of your shows and stuff like that, but I never really hear much about your background. And I know we talked a little bit about it, but like not much. And I'm just really interested, like, how did you get started in this chemistry stuff? Like, did you like to do it as a kid? Like, what was going on? And, like, how did you get to the place where you are now? Because, like, I think, you know, you're brilliant and you know so much about this stuff. Like, what about other people who, you know, are, are trying to get into this? Like, what did you do and what would you recommend they do? Yeah, I think there's no trick. That's the, that's the trick. I get these emails every single day of people saying, what class do I have to take? What degree do I need to acquire to get your job? And it's a really... <laughs> they're trying to get you, get, get you, know, you out of a job. All, they're trying so, to compete funny. with me. But uh, no, it's, it's a really bad way of thinking about these questions because, first of all, to become a journalist, absolutely nothing is required as far as I can tell. I certainly never studied journalism in college. I didn't take a single class. Um, and no one has ever asked me if I did. So that's the funny thing. They'll, you know, most of the people constructing these stories have no real authoritative claim to be telling them. And I started thinking, well, you know, I'm, I care very passionately about psychoactive drugs. And the legacy. So how did that start a little bit? Like, your, your passion uh, well, they're pretty psychoactive damn drugs? interesting, right? I mean. I think most people are interested in psychoactive drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am a little bit, but like, I would never say I'm passionate about them. Like, that's interesting to me. Well, yeah, I, I would say that the really passionate interest came from becoming aware of the research of Alexander Shulgin when I was in high school. And, uh, yeah. Which was really a transformative experience for me on multiple levels. The first level was, you know, when you get a copy of P-Call and T-Call, you think, oh my god, he made everything. There's nothing left to do. It's all been done. He made literally hundreds of tryptamines and phenethylamines. So that's gone. But then you realize, no wait, there's so much more. And in fact, you can contribute to this research still. And even better, the chemistry is not that difficult. That's one of the things that I find so beautiful about organic synthesis. You have to be you know, a, a true genius to maybe discover a new reaction, but using the, the known tools that pretty much any undergraduate 
organic chemistry student has, you can still make amazing contributions, if only by accident, to the field. You don't have to be brilliant to discover. Well, here's the crazy thing. Like, I took organic chemistry in, in college, and I thought it was the worst. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I was I just know. like, well, it's such what? an empowering. I mean, it's such amazing knowledge. Maybe, oh, no, maybe, for sure. maybe you feel the same way about. Like I thought it was so hard and like all hard. this stuff. Yeah, it's, like, it's very hard, but there's so much power in it. I mean, oh, that, that's, really? it's the only class that you can take two semesters of organic chemistry and come out of it capable, if you were paying attention, capable of synthesizing a nerve agent, capable of making all sorts of explosives, capable of making a variety of different psychoactive drugs. I mean. The, the chemistry behind a lot of these things that people care about, these chemical commodities that are important, is not all that complicated. Did you take organic chemistry? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah, you did. Oh, of wow. Of course, yeah. Did that, like, inspire you a lot, or...? Uh, yeah. Yeah? It did. So do you have a, a lab set up somewhere at home or clandestine? No, no. <laughs> I mean, I, that's a, as a public figure, I, I can't break the law in that way. But I was lucky enough uh, pretty early, well, I was still in school to meet a chemist named Jason Wallach, who was uh, starting a PhD program. And we were both very passionate about the same sort of chemistry. And we started working together on the weekends. And so for the last decade, I have gone to this small pharmacy school in Philadelphia on the weekends and have done chemistry research, and I've published quite a bit of it in scholarly journals, you know, it's real research. Yeah, it's really interesting. You, yeah. you have contributed a lot, and like, I wonder, so have you thought ever about getting a PhD, or like, what, is something holding you back, course, you want yeah. to? Well, I really like what I'm doing now as well. It's hard, because, you know, I think a lot of people, th there's a certain, something nice about not knowing exactly what you want to do. In some sense, I think I was almost too certain from the beginning of what I wanted to do. I knew that I really wanted to start filling in some of the gaps in the work that Alexander Shulgin had done. And as soon as I got the opportunity to start investigating that realm of chemistry, it was such an amazingly satisfying thing for me that I thought, all right, well, this is, this is it. This is pretty much what I want to be doing. So what more do I want? Do I want more responsibility associated with this work? This is already like a good amount. And then on top of that, you know, I, I care passionately about these other things like writing and, and filmmaking and to be able to explore those as well has been an amazing freedom. But of course, um, especially uh, with the research that I find really compelling, I'm aware that to do justice to it, it would require intensive academic research. And so it's always bouncing around as a possibility, but you know. Yeah, no, no, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, my passion it's the same thing, like, if I was doing this all before I got a PhD, like, I, I probably wouldn't have gone. Like, getting to explore the thing that you want to explore and nobody telling you what to do exactly. Like, that, that, that I thought was like the epitome of science. That's like why I went to graduate school, was because I thought I was going to be able to do all that stuff, and it ended up kind of not being that way, but I've kind of like drifted back towards that, and I found it's just awesome. Like. It's amazing. I get to explore all the things that I'm interested in. Yeah, I can't imagine doing it any other way, really. Oh, yeah? So, oh, you got a question? All right, sure. Question. Um, I know that you said you don't really have any trick to give someone, but I wanted to know your uh, opinion on colleges, because the reason I got into biology was because of how abundant life is. And so I thought it was kind of harder uh, making this decision of do I want to get into organic chemistry or biology in my own DIY lab sense. Uh, so I thought that it would be easier to get into biology because, hey, plants are everywhere. You know, dirt can make all these compounds just by planting a seed. So I was wondering if uh, you think college is a valuable route if I were looking to get into uh, organic chemistry if there is some other alternative route. I think it is, yeah. But I also think that someone who is passionate and capable of educating themselves, which every person who really cares about these subjects has to do on some level, um, can probably teach themselves the same lessons, possibly depending on how dedicated you are. Um, if it's 
possible for you to t take these classes in college, I think you should. I think it would actually be much easier than teaching yourself. And you'd be more inclined to be pushed in directions that might be uncomfortable that you could potentially avoid if you were purely self-taught. That would be my expectation. So forgive my ig ignorance on the subject, but uh, you know, you said you're passionate about film and, and making film and all these things. Uh, your show and other work you may have done, like what have you done in film? What do you want to explore? Are there other things you want to explore? Like do you, you know, work in filmmaking and directing your shows or, or, or like, you know, a little bit about your film passion? Right. Well, when I interviewed you, that was actually for Vice's show on HBO, which I have very little creative control over or, or minimal, not as much. On my own show, I have total creative control, which I like a lot more. So you didn't really see the best of, of uh, my creative situation. But, you know, I'm very aware of the power of the media. And that power is evident in the way that they have treated this very subject of biohacking. It's evident in the way they've treated psychoactive drugs historically. And I think a lot of that power is misused by people who aren't some kind of, you know, cynical government pawns that are trying to manipulate people, but people, these journalists often just don't know in the same way that people in the DEA often simply don't know. It's not because they're doing this out of some malicious intent. They're simply ill-informed. And all it takes is one person who does understand the subject matter to decide to be the person that speaks about it publicly, and it can have a, a really significant impact. So I saw all of this coverage re relating to emerging psychoactive drugs, and I saw how stupid and terrible it was, and thought, OK, well, I guess I can do it too, and I'll just do a better job. And I think it's that simple. That's a good question. Um, so, hi, my name is Mario. I'm part of the Counterculture Labs group here, and um, kind of with the, the discussion that we started about with like, oh, I feel like I need a PhD to like be a, a, a voice on some of this stuff, kind of um, like hits me in a really personal place because I feel like what we're trying to do here at Counterculture Labs is break down all those walls and make it so that people don't feel like they need to have a PhD to have a cogent opinion on something. And it's kind of, um, and, you know, especially with the work that you're doing too, it's like, it's, it's, it's crazy for me to hear you say that because what I really want to hear from both of you guys is, hey, you know, we're changing the opinions of people in science. And, you know, Alan Rockefeller is a great example of somebody who, like, yeah, he doesn't is. have any of those accolades, but is 100% on the front lines of science. And so, you know, like, what I want to question you guys is, like, how are you changing that conversation to make it so that people who are smart, who are willing, because, you know, the other thing about, you know, whether I go into this program or this college, it doesn't matter where you go, it's the networks that you build, you know? So like, we're trying to build a network here where anybody can come, and like, that's what I love. You can go and sit at a table with Alan Rockefeller just because you showed up on a Wednesday night. You don't need to have any, you know, education or whatever, and so, you know, I see people that are in these positions where, you know, a lot of eyes on you guys. Like, I wanna, you know, hear less talk about like how important the PhD and the accolades are and like how much more important it is to like hear people's conversations and like build those networks that people can rely on because I think that's the kind of thing that like builds this fountain of science that's available all these years. You know, if somebody doesn't get the opportunity to express themselves, we lose that mind, you know? So. Yeah, no, it's totally true. Give them a hand. Yeah, I think that's totally true. And here's the thing, I'm not saying people should get a PhD. Uh, I think you, people might have took what I said the wrong way or the things I was saying the wrong way. It's, so we live in a world where there are hierarchies, whether we like it or not, right? There are hierarchies. People who have positions that allow them you know, generally more power in the world, right? The president can do an awful lot more shit than I can. It's just an accepted fact of life that I have. And unfortunately, the public, the media, people like that, they see somebody with a PhD as an expert or somebody who could say stuff on a topic. I'm not saying that I think anybody needs a PhD to be an expert in something, a subject, you know, g genetic engineering, gene therapy, or anything like that. And so many people here can attest to that because I've strived so hard in the community to 
give people the chance to show that they could do just as well as a PhD, and so many people can, so that you know they could show that you don't need a PhD. Unfortunately, I do have one, <laughs> you know, very unfortunately. And so I have to kind of embrace that because it gives me the a power to speak and people will listen and so I can kind of try to move things along. And on the flip side, I don't feel comfortable criticizing that because I don't have a PhD, so it would just make me look like an asshole if I said, uh, oh, you don't need one because I don't have one, you know? So, and I, and I would never suggest that education isn't valuable or that people shouldn't pursue graduate education because it's pretty damn clear to me that it is valuable. I also think that it's used lazily as a crutch by people um, to, just as shorthand for I'm smart. I went to this school, I have this degree, and your Alan Rockefeller example is a very good one because as far as I know, he didn't go to college at all and he's considered one of the you know leading experts in his field. So there are exceptional people and it's a lazy and ultimately stupid thing to just assume somebody's smart based on what university they went to or what degrees they have. Um, at the same time, I wouldn't suggest that people not pursue education. Yeah, I taught some medical school students and you don't want those people working. <laughs> but you, unfortunately you have to, so. Um, this question is more for Hamilton than anything else, um, but Josiah, feel free to comment on it. Um, so, in terms of the work of organizations like the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies and um, other organizations that are bringing psychedelics to the forefront of medical research, um, what is the role of nonprofits and different organizations in the biohacker community, and how can those style organizations change the narrative a little bit? especially as, as speaking as somebody who's involved in the creation of media. How can nonprofit organizations... Or the organizations like biohacker organizations. Help maps or help what? Um, more so change the narrative around biohacking. Uh, if, well, if you effectively help anyone, that's going to be great press. So, you know, the way the, the press feeds on sensation so if somebody is using biohacking in a way that's perceived as frivolous or dangerous, that will be jumped on and that will be the way that it's characterized in the press. If that, those same resources are dedicated to treating HIV or anything or malaria or anything that's kind of airtight in terms of it serving the public good, then that will benefit the community, ultimately. I mean, I think that, uh, and I, you know, maybe everybody doesn't have the same opinion as me, but I generally think, and there's obviously, you know, cases where this isn't true, but I think that almost any press is good press for most, most things, right? Obviously, if you kill or rape or murder some people or some, something bad like that is not good press. To a point, though, because it, at some point, you know, with psychedelics, they're made illegal, and then scientific research is halted. Oh, no. I mean, I get it. I get it. But, like, will press change that, you think? Yes. I think someone earlier brought up Michael Pollan's new book, and I think one of the great ironies of that book is it's sort of the story of how psychedelic research was destroyed, but he never identifies the role of journalists when he himself is a journalist. And they played an immense role in propagating hysteria surrounding these substances, in, in refusing to acknowledge their medical and scientific value, and a lot of that may have been, you know, it's, it's a complicated scenario. It's hard to say exactly what should oh, have yes, been done. Oh, but is that more of like a pre-existing hysteria than like something they might have initiated? I know because of like, you know, obviously. And I'm looking through the literature and I see some guy in France was struggling with exactly the same problem in the 1950s. And I think, wow, strange. This has been going on internationally for the better part of 100 years, and maybe he knew someone who was struggling with the same problem before that. And, uh, and you are part of, you know, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. You're part of a, a long legacy, and maybe, maybe, I don't, maybe I'm being unfair saying that we'll never be immortal, but uh, <laughs> and, and these are all worthwhile pursuits. I, I guess I sometimes just think that all of the 
the uh, bioethical hand wringing is absurd. No, I agree. In, in light of how far we are from the. No offense realities. to the bioethicists. And stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd prefer not to say because it's a very personal thing, and if someone beats me to it, I'll be annoyed. <laughs> so when I look at uh, your platform on Vice, right, the way that you make pharmaceuticals uh, more presented scientifically, Josiah, how is it that you think that you're developing the message for the biohacking community to meet those type of standards where it's a readily acceptable lay understanding rather than, you know, inside baseball. Yeah, no, it's really interesting because like, I haven't found the proper, like, I, I like your voice on, I mean, not literally, but like, <laughs> like, the story you tell because you find that balance between scientific and like it's approachable and I don't know if I've quite found that yet myself because sometimes I just like try to make it so approachable that people just think I'm crazy lunatic like oh yeah anybody could do this like let's just hang out and go to a bar and like do this on the bar or something like that and people don't take me seriously enough or I won't explain the science I don't explain like the six months or years of research that I did before this to lead up to that point nobody sees that cameras don't see it you know because they didn't know about it until a week ago and newspapers don't see it and stuff and so it's like I'm still trying to find that balance between like scientific and like approachable well, it's hard in this area as well because it's relatively new, so the, the dangers aren't as clearly delineated. You know, with psychoactive drugs, there's things that you have to steer clear of. You can't advocate them like a zealot because that leads to problems, and we know that. And you also can't advocate for their prohibition because that leads to problems as well. So there are these boundaries that you stay within and you won't cause any major problems, and you might even have a small chance of making things better for people. But I don't think those same sorts of rules exist with an area as new as this. Yeah, no, there's a lot of, there's a lot of freedom to like figure that out. But like, I, I feel like people think science is boring. I don't think so. You don't? No. <laughs> like if there's like a science documentary or something like that, like I watch all documentaries, but I never watch the science ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe the science documentaries are boring. I mean, I think the other thing is that people assume that science is boring, and so they don't actually expose people to it. Everything has to be described in terms of metaphors or oversimplified explanations, because if someone were to actually see what it really is, it might be boring, and that would be so terrible. How could we possibly risk that? But then I started thinking, partially because I'm a contrarian and I sort of like to fuck with people a little bit, uh, thinking, well, you know, the, when I started my show, they said, you can't glorify drugs and you can't teach people exactly how to synthesize them. And, uh, and I thought, well, wait a second. First of all, there's no, that's not true. There's no law that says that you can't describe chemistry to people. That's just not true. Show me that law, it doesn't exist. So that was the first thing where I, I challenged them to show me a, a reason why you can't talk about a total synthesis of a psychoactive drug, there wasn't one. And then I thought, all right, I'll just televise a total synthesis of MDMA, starting from sassafras root bark essential oil. And I'll televise a total synthesis of ketamine as well. And uh, while I'm at it, I'll do some muscimol type compounds and amphetamine and you know, just on and on and on and on and on. And people were extremely receptive to it. And the barriers that I think most people would have imagined simply didn't exist. You know, when they were printing advertisements for my show in New York, they said, do you want to do anything? And I said, yeah, I'd like to draw uh, you know, a reaction scheme for the total synthesis of MDMA and run it through the entire New York subway system. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I said, well, let's just try. Let's just see. <laughs> Let's just see if anyone objects, see what, see what the M MTA has to say about it. The MTA did not object. And <laughs> they had it, no idea what it was, right? They didn't. And so it ran, it was, this really happened. You can see photos of it. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's so good. I love it. <laughs> um, 
Can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, uh, Miss Dr. Mr. Morris, uh, do you have any, uh, do you use any like computational chemistry software for small molecule design or for small protein therapeutic design or would you, if you talk to anybody that's like going down that approach without getting a PhD? I don't do any work with proteins, but I use a program called Reaxis. It's very similar to another program called SciFinder that's more widely used. And it's a very, very useful piece of software if you can find access to it. It allows you to input a target molecule and you can specify you know, various functional groups in different ways and then it will show you every published synthesis of that molecule. So it's, it's pretty damn useful. Cool, cool. Questions? Oh, no, I got a question for you. Because this is a question I've really become interested in lately. And I've become interested just in, you know, uh, you know like I, I, people shoot me all the time, so documentary filmmaking and all this type of stuff. And I'm really interested in stories and like how to tell stories and how to tell a good story. And I'm just wondering, you know, like, is there stories you love or story you love or do you think a lot about that when you're documentary f when when you're filmmaking or, or shooting stuff and like you know does stories mean something to you oh yeah storytelling is everything i mean i, I absolutely love storytelling that's the kind of thing that unites everything for me even in science you know i think that that's one of the real tragedies of, of scientific writing is that there's never a narrative component to it. So you don't know how people got to a certain place. You don't know what they were thinking. You know, take a drug like MK801. This is like what, one, yeah, uh, one, <laughs> one, one person likes MK801. Um, but this is, you know, widely used in scientific research as a selective NMDA antagonist. Um, it kind of came out of nowhere. What was the story behind that? What were they thinking when they discovered this? No one has really improved on this structure in decades. It's an amazing molecule. What was going on? No one knows. So I think that that's, you know, like one of the, the sad things is a lot of scientists undervalue the narrative component of what they're doing. And it's, it's very useful to think about that because even outside of journalistic interpretation or making film, filmmaking or anything like that, it's useful to other scientists to know how you got to a certain place, to know the narrative of the discovery yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting and crazy, and it's something that, you know, I tried to push for with this conference a little bit to move away from that very, like, academic type of, like, giving a talk and conveying information and try to turn it more into, like, a story or a conversation, something that told more about what the subject was than just PowerPoint slides or something like that. I don't know if I quite achieved it or... or, or or will or have yet, um, but it was something I was I was really going for uh, because yeah, like academic science, it's and I've sat through you know during your PhD, holy, there's so many. What's up? What's up, Gabe? Would the owner of a blue Toyota, maybe a Corolla, please go and unblock somebody's driveway? Anybody? Anyone? If you park in front of a driveway yeah. in the street out here, if you did. Blue Toyota, anyone? Not nice. All right. Okay, just double checking. <laughs> sorry. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Any yeah, other question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, the storytelling, and it's like, why does science, that's one thing I'm trying to find out, like, you know, whether science is boring or not, or you think science is boring or not. I, and during my PhD, I sat through like hundreds of talks and hundreds and hundreds. And I'll be honest, I fell asleep through probably 99% of them. And I'm like, is there another way? Like, is there another way to tell this story of science that's like entertaining and fun? There absolutely is, but I think people are afraid. There's a lot of fear in, in science. And I think this comes back to the emphasis on your pedigree, on your degree, on the institutions that you're associated with, because everyone wants to be taken seriously. And if you, you know, risk being funny or risk doing something that's unorthodox, especially something like self-experimentation that could potentially even be illegal, then... Oh, man, yeah, you know what's crazy? So one of the first experiments I did, you know, that kind of started out my whole, you know, like, career in the media 
was this microbiome transplant. And it's, I'll, I'll be honest with you, to date, I probably have not done a more thorough self-experimentation. And I, I you know, consulted with professors from MIT and UCLA and all these different places. And they helped me design the experiment. I did all this, you know, I literally tried to change the bacteria on my whole body and replace it with somebody else's bacteria just to like see what would happen and see if it affected my health and things like that. And I did all these sequencing. They taught me how to use the software so I could analyze it myself and what was good ways to look at the data and compare it and do all this crazy stuff. And then when, you know, the press wanted to talk to me and I was like, hey, you know, would you be willing to like talk to press or like say anything? And every science, academic scientist was like, no way. They wouldn't even like say that they like talked to me or like consulted on the project or anything because they were so afraid that somebody might be like, did you support this like self-experimentation? Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of fear. Yeah, and it just is, is crazy. And to the point that people misrepresent themselves. I mean, I remember that there was a, a researcher who's studying Salvinorin A, and, um, and I know for a fact that he used it himself and enjoyed it and used psychedelics himself, and he was affiliated with a prestigious Ivy League university. And I remember I was asking him um, to you know, pr either consult or maybe even interview him for an episode of my show about salvia and he was saying well i really hope that you don't use salvia you know on camera because that would be really bad and i was sort of just couldn't believe that you know the hypocrisy that somebody would feel comfortable talking about these yeah, things that is crazy but this is the way it goes because people I mean, and, and again i i do sort of understand where he's coming from because yeah. he feels like he has to be a hypocrite because if you were honest about who he is and what he does, then it could interfere with the legitimacy of the entire field. So it's a complicated situation. There isn't a single right way to do it. But in an ideal situation, people wouldn't have to misrepresent themselves and could speak honestly and openly about what they are passionate about. All right, question. Uh, sorry if this is off topic, but I just kind of want to get back to uh, storytelling as a way of teaching. So uh, throughout uh, the majority of human history, that's what we did to explain the natural world. I mean, just look at mythology and you know maybe perhaps religion if you look deep into it and uh, see it as mythology. It's just trying to teach us something about the natural world in a way that is entertaining and and you know. Yeah. What happens is like science was as fun as like video games or something. Yeah. So like. <laughs> Why do you think we took a departure from uh, explaining the natural world in such a magical, story-driven way and, and turned it into what it is now? Do you think it's like the way we use education to make workers or, you know, <laughs> like what do you think? Uh, I think, well, part of it is that science is different from storytelling. I think scientific history can be communicated through storytelling, but ultimately, um, you want to encourage different things. You want to encourage experimentation and questioning, which doesn't necessarily work well with storytelling always. So I think that the, the goal of science education has been to cultivate a different set of values. And I don't know that it's necessarily misguided either. I think that it is good to encourage people to question and experiment and how to devise experiments. Those are all absolutely crucial for cultivating a scientific understanding of the world. Um, but I think storytelling would help as well. Yeah, no, uh, that's uh, really what a, really interesting because I've been thinking a lot about languages lately and how science could be like a different language than storytelling. And a lot of things are different languages. And the way we pick up new skills is basically by learning different languages, right? Like if I'm going to play soccer or something like that, I learn the language of like, oh, this is the thing I need to do to kick the ball, right? Not, not necessarily specifically speaking, but it might be a physical language or it could just be a literal language with science. There's acronyms and words and philosophies and ideas and that's the language. Um, but is it, like, is there a way to do science? Because I think, long and hard about the philosophy of science and the way we do science and why we do it the way we do it and is it possible to do it differently and still be just or more successful 
you know, has anybody studied what's the best way to do science? And is there a way to do science that maybe could be a story? And I know it's like really fucking deep and weird, but like could, you know, you were saying that science is this different language than a story, but is there a way maybe to do science where it could be a story? Maybe. I mean, and one thing that's, and I'm sure you have this experience as well, is because a lot of my coverage concerns people that work in clandestine drug labs. So I get a lot of emails from people that are completely outside of the academic sphere who are doing research, sometimes research that actually could be valuable or could be useful to everyone, oftentimes not. And, uh, and one thing that you know, bothers me a little bit when I talk to some of these people is like, oh, could you just be a tiny bit more rigorous, please? You know, you're, you're not actually helping anyone if you don't weigh out the quantity of this reducing agent that you're using because you can't repeat it afterwards. So there is like a certain degree of rigor that's required that isn't fun, but it's, you know, necessary to document experiments so that they're reproducible and so that other people can learn from them. And yeah, it's interesting because like, you know, like back, you know, 500 years ago, people might just throw some stuff together and see it happen, but I guess like it might not be reproducible. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Very, very interesting. All right, any, any more final questions? Yeah, maybe we can argue about that later. <laughs> One more question. Hamilton, I'm sorry if you get this question a lot, but I have to ask it. What's your favorite drug? <laughs> yeah. I can't. I can't answer it because you know it's like asking someone what their favorite song or their favorite food is. I, I see drugs as this extremely diverse arsenal of tools that have different purposes and are valuable in different situations. And so there's no single drug. I mean, maybe caffeine, that's an extremely boring answer, but it's one of the most versatile drugs out there. So I can't help but love it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I could name some really obscure stuff, but what is, you know, what's the point of that? <laughs> Did I get to answer the question? No. Thank you. All right, everybody. Let's thank Hamilton. I just gave you a so that concludes everything. I think there's still some beer and water and stuff in the back. And like I said earlier, people afterward will probably head down to the Avenue Bar just down the street and hang out. I'm sure there will be people there. But feel free to hang out and talk and ask questions and everything like that. Otherwise, before you go, I'd just like to thank you know the people who have help, helped us out so much, all the volunteers. Everybody give them a hand. Thank the volunteers. Without them, I could not have done any of this, and especially Esther and Peter and Micah, you all have been super great. <laughs> and uh, anyways, see, see you all next.